Hello, my name is Tama Nakahara. Uh, I run the developer experience team here at WeWorks and welcome to our Weave online user group. Uh, if this is your first time, well, welcome. This is a regular series that we do uh, every other Tuesday and uh, we've been doing it for this season. We have speakers from our own team. We have guest speakers, uh, all nicely curated by uh, Stacy, who's one of our community managers. She's the person behind the um, Weave online user group or the Weave uh, logo here. So, uh, and I see some returning people, so it's great to see you back. I hope that you guys are all being able to stay safe and that we can provide you Weave online user group content <laughs> to keep you occupied and um, hopefully being able to learn new stuff. So today we're very excited because we have one of the members of our team, Stefan Prodon, who's a developer experience engineer. Um, if you don't already know him, he's the person who created Flagger. And we're very excited to announce that um, he's been working hard for a very long time and we've even gotten a few people contributing um, and uh, reached the point of being able to have Flagger 1.0. We also thank a lot of people who helped in uh, giving feedback and testing to get us to this point. So we're very excited to be able to cover this topic today. So just a little bit about us, if this is the first time you're here. Uh, so uh, we work for a company called Weaveworks. So that's uh, Stacy, Stefan and I and other people. Uh, we're a startup based in London, San Francisco, New York, Berlin and Colorado with distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of RabbitMQ, our uh, let me click my slide here. Yeah, our CEO and uh, founding CTO are the people who created RabbitMQ, both the technology and then the company that they sold to VMware. Uh, and we are a VC funded uh, company by Axel Partners and others. Uh, one of our funders is Google Ventures, uh, among others. Uh, we just mentioned them as part of our overall commitment to the container and Kubernetes space where we pretty much built so much of uh, what we do in both product and open source. Uh, so speaking of open source, uh, so much of what we do is based on open source. This is just, this is not even a complete list of um, all the types of projects we've either, um, well, in this case that we've created um, uh, and uh, some of which we've put out to CNCF. And we also do do contributions to the Kubernetes community, um, whether in code or in involvement with SIGs. Um, so as you see here, uh, Flagger is the topic that we'll cover today, which is um, what uh, helps you do progressive delivery in a particularly Kubernetes way. Progressive delivery being a fairly new term uh, that covers things like canary deployments, blue green, um, AV, et cetera. Uh, and to mention a few others, um, it is strongly based on Flux, uh, which is now in CNCF. And that's the uh, automated deployments project that we created that really triggered the concept of GitOps. Uh, as well as Cortex, which is built upon Prometheus. Uh, you'll see how Flagger uses Prometheus metrics um, and Cortex has built upon and improved upon uh, Prometheus. Uh, and many, many more here. So if this is your first time, you can definitely check out our GitHub repo of all these different projects that were created by our teams. And we also do have paid products. So the product that we've had the longest is Weave Cloud. It's a SaaS product that helps you monitor, manage, and uh, do automated deployments for your Kubernetes clusters. And um, it, in some ways, is hosted versions of some of the open source projects that we used. It provides a UI and also integrates them much, much more uh, neatly in an enterprise way, for example, especially um, Flux and the, those Cortex metrics. Uh, Weave Cloud itself is built on Kubernetes on AWS, and we've had it running now for about four years in production. So based on that knowledge, a lot of people started asking us about how we might productize that uh, layer as well as offer much needed consulting and training. So as of now, um, almost a year and a half ago, we pivoted to include and build upon this new product, which is uh, now uh, soon to be uh, in regular demo mode. We've demoed it before, but we'll be regularly demoing it. And it is, of course, a very GitOps aware enterprise platform. So um, we add some consulting training support for that so for people who are looking. So if you're interested, uh, and this is your first time, our website is weave.works. So certainly check out those products there as well as our open source projects. And if you have any questions, you'll get a follow up email and you can certainly email me uh, if there's anything you'd like to know more about. 
So thanks for listening to that part. Now we'll just do a quick housekeeping. Uh, as I mentioned, Stefan and I, Stefan and I are here for this session. Uh, if you've been here before, you know that these sessions, um, we say they usually go between 30 to 45, but I don't know if we've had a 30 minute session yet. Yeah, usually about 45 minutes um, with a talk and questions. Um, if there are a lot of burning, burning questions and we go over, then we have an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes. Um, so we have some flexibility, but we generally hover around 45. Uh, we're using Zoom as a platform, and uh, if you need to ask questions, use the chat box. Uh, hopefully you can find that button on the top uh, left corner of your screen. If you don't see it, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode in Zoom, and you can see all the capabilities. Uh, and when you ask questions, make sure that you ask to all panelists and attendees, not just to panelists, because uh, in that way everybody else can see your questions and sometimes people answer each other's questions as well. Um, unless you have something burningly private, please make sure to use all panelists and attendees. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Stefan. Let me know if I need to stop sharing. Hello, folks. Hey. Okay, I'll share okay. my screen. Yes, and do you prefer questions throughout or at the end? Throughout. Throughout, okay. So I'll be monitoring the chat box with your questions and I'll bring them up when Stefan has a pause in his talk. All right, do I need to Great. stop sharing or are you good? Yeah, yeah, I can share. Okay, take a look. Okay, so I have a presentation here. Um, talk about Flagger. Um, <clears throat> I'm now calling it the progressive delivery operator for Kubernetes, but uh, it started as uh, the Istio operator for Kubernetes um, two years ago. We'll go go through that. Um, what's Flagger all about? What's what's trying to do is uh, make progressive delivery possible with just uh, um, a very tiny tool that you write, uh, you run on Kubernetes, no external dependencies or anything like that. Um, and yeah, what, what's, what's the deal of progressive delivery? The, the main goal of, of doing this is to reduce risk when you deploy a new version of your app. Um, it's as simple as that. How you can reduce the risk? Well. Um, you can expose that version to a percentage of your users, uh, test your app in production on, on those users. If everything works, you can creep in, keep increasing the, the traffic rate and so on. And finally roll out everything to production. Um, a lot of companies are doing that. It's not, it's not something uh, new. Uh, the term wants to encompass a couple of um, techniques. Um, Canary releases, A-B testing, blue-green mirroring, and all this stuff. I'll, I'll go through each one of them so you can understand the differences. Um, in order to create progressive delivery pipelines or um, implement one of those techniques, you, you need a couple of things. For example, um, your CI pipeline should, should produce immutable artifacts. Um, no you don't, you cannot deploy reliably if you tag your um, containers with latest or V1 and everything is V1 until it reaches V2. Um, whatever you are trying to deploy on production should be uh, immutable, should be unique. Uh, so please use some version, please use um, the git commit SHA or whatever you can in your CI pipeline to ensure that all the all these artifacts like container images, like uh, static files and so on can be uh, addressed by um, a unique ID that you can easily switch between them if you need to do a rollback and stuff like that. Um, other things you could, uh, you should uh, build in your pipeline is, um, there are this, this approach to continuous delivery where you don't, you don't deploy, you deploy your images, your artifacts to an artifacts repository, let's say a container registry or a CDN or stuff like that. But you don't actually touch the production cluster from your CI pipelines. 
the CI role should end uh, with um, outputting those artifacts. Now, when those artifacts reach, let's say the, the container registry, then some process will kick off from inside your cluster and, and will try to reconcile your cluster with uh, what you want to run on it. Why is this uh, an advantage? The fact that you don't have to share your, let's say, um, API keys with, uh, with some external services. Uh, and if, let's say, your CI tooling that's running outside of Kubernetes loses connection to your, uh, to your cluster, then your deployment will, will fail. It will be like, Half, half of the things were deployed, half not, and stuff like that. So you'll end up with a broken state, and it's very hard to resume such a, such a failed deployment. If your uh, CD tooling is running inside the cluster, then it can you know, uh, work on its own. If the cluster goes down, then, well, your production system is down, nothing else to do. Um, what else you need for progressive delivery? You need, you need something that can uh, do routing and not only routing like, um, like a normal, like a CNI plugin. I'm not talking here about layer four routing. I'm talking about layer seven where, um, where the routing components understands uh, HTTP requests, headers, cookies, um, and all these uh, layer seven details. Why it's simple? Because uh, you have to um, segment your, uh, your users in order to do this progressive rollout. Uh, in order to segment the users, you have to have control over, you have your routing component has to understand what's an HTTP request or a gRPC request and how to route that uh, to different backends. What other things? Of course, observability. You need, um, you need statistics, you need metrics, you need tracing in some cases. Um, your system should be instrumented in some way and expose not only performance uh, stats, like let's say the latency of your request, but also business metrics. So you can take decisions uh, based on, um, you know, um, KPIs that are uh, specific to your app or to your platform. So having that progressive delivery idea, uh, in 2018 um, at WeWorks, we defined some goals, what we want to do, how, how can we implement this kind of um, um, deployment strategies. And if we are going to do that, what will be our goals? Um, the main goal is to give developer confidence in production releases, like deploy on Friday and all that stuff. Uh, don't be afraid to uh, merge a pull request and you don't have to look at dashboards. You don't have to be there when the, when the deployment happens. You can, you know, um, click merge and go home. The system should take care of that. Um, how can we give confidence uh, in, in these automation tools? Well, we should allow developers or operators to define the validation process. How you, how you know your app is okay to be rolled out to your whole uh, user base. Um, maybe you want to run some automated testing inside your uh, production environment. Um, there is a there is this fallacy that you know you have this staging or integration environment and that's exactly like production and if I'm running my test there uh, everything will work in uh, in in with real traffic. Well, that doesn't actually happen all the time. Uh, so you may want to rerun your tests uh, in your production environment as well um, while. Uh, live traffic is uh, is hitting your your application. Other things, well, for for some manual gating is still a still a thing. Um, some people, you know, um, release managers they want to click a button and yeah validate this this version is okay. Um, actually deployed uh, 
to all users. So manual gating should be one, one part of that solution. Uh, actually, this came um, late in, in Flagger development. And of course, automated rollback and on all these things. Uh, if, if something fails, if, if the application fails, if the metrics aren't right, um, the tooling should do that uh, automatically. Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be, you know, someone that does a kubectl apply on the old deployment or something like that. Uh, another goal was to expose all these things that are going on in your cluster during the deployment um, and have a real time feedback of what's going on, like how much of, a, of the traffic is routed to the new version, uh, how many errors, how, how is the latency doing, and so on. So there is a need for real time feedback for people to actually trust the, uh, the tooling, they actually need to see what's going on and the tooling should have like this uh, fast loop alerting and feedback system. And another goal, because we are talking about Kubernetes is writing as little YAML as possible, right? You don't want to spend up um, days writing uh, uh, thousands of lines of YAML that, you know, you mix tabs with spaces and everything uh, goes wrong. And since we are talking about Kubernetes, we want to do all this, we want to define all this process um, with, um, with YAMLs and we can put those YAMLs in a Git repository and from there everything should, um, should work, like make it GitOps in a way. So this is how we came up with Flagger. Um, I think I want to show you the first ever pre-release. I think it, yes, it's this one. So it's in 7th of October. Um, it wasn't called Flagger at the beginning. I call it Steerer, Steerer. <laughs> so yeah, Alexis, our CEO said, hey, it's a bad name change it and uh, actually he came up with the, with the flagger name so yeah this is this is actually the first ever uh, release um, and everything started after kubecon in copenhagen when i had a, so i had a talk on um, i did a demo of istio canary deployments with GitOps. so you put something in git and you start route traffic, you modifying it, the, uh, the traffic weight in a YAML, you commit it, then it routes 10%, then you do another commit, routes 50% and so on. Um, that was the demo, uh, it's, it's on YouTube. After that talk, uh, a couple of people came to me and said, hey, we, we, we cannot do that. I mean, we have like 100 services. We cannot do this uh, type type commit push wait look at the grafana dashboard everything is good increment it and so on um, and someone mentioned hey why why couldn't couldn't this process be automated in the same way that the horizontal pod auto scaler works like it increments something or decrements something if you know based on traffic or whatever so this is how the, the Flagger idea started uh, after that kubecon. And I started experimenting back then with um, Istio because it was the only solution that I know of that could do um, the traffic shifting in a declarative manner. Like you push a custom resource and it will just apply that traffic weight. Um, and this is how it all started. Anyway, the Flagger is no longer just Istio, it, it works with a lot of things and we'll talk about it. Um, but the main idea behind Flagger is to create a declarative model for decoupling the deployment from the release process. Like you can do the deployment, but something else takes care of the release. And that something else is Flagger. Uh, the deployment can be done, I don't know, from CI with kubectl apply or uh, using a GitOps operator or, um, I don't know, applying a Helm chart and so on. Uh, but that just, that's just the deployment part. It doesn't mean that if you do a, a, 
uh, a deployment applied, that doesn't mean that version of the app is also exposed, rolled out to your users. It's rolled out on the cluster, is not exposed to your users, and from there, Flagger takes, takes it on and does, uh, does its magic. Or what kind of deployment strategies Flagger implements? Um, the first one I did in uh, 2018 was scanner release with progressive traffic shipping. Um, it works with, uh, with most applications that expose HTTP or gRPC uh, APIs. Um, but it doesn't quite work for web applications that have user interfaces. And I'll explain why. Like when you route traffic based on percentage, and let's say you have a static file, a JavaScript file, another static file, an HTML file, and the actual API on, the, on your app, and your app is packaged like that. Uh, when you route, let's say, 1% and 99% to the old version, 1% to the new version, there is a chance that some user will get the new JavaScript code with the old HTML file or the new HTML file with the old CSS file, so on. So you can imagine like your app will be broken. So I think it was a couple of months into building Flagger that um, I, a lot of people tried it uh, and I, I got this feedback like, okay, we cannot actually use uh, the progressive traffic shifting for, uh, for our front end app. And I looked into, okay, how can I pin users on a specific version? And the answer is um, A-B testing. Um, use HTTP headers or cookies to pin users on that version that you want to test. And some examples are, I want to test only on uh, Android users. Well, there is an HTTP header for that. It's, uh, it's the user agent. You can look at the user agent, identify the Android users, and route only those users to the new version. And there are so many examples. You can have your own, you can set your own cookies, you can create insiders programs, and you, um, let's say your users apply, uh, are applying to be insiders, you give them a cookie, and based on that cookie, you use those users to test the new version and so on. So that's how A-B testing came into, into Flagger for, for this particular need. Uh, not all uh, service meshes and uh, ingress controllers support that, uh, supports this, but uh, uh, I think most of them at some point will, uh, will actually support header and cookie traffic routing because it's, a, it's an actual, um, for, for some particular apps, it's not possible to do um, random traffic shifting. Another deployment strategy is uh, blue-green with traffic mirroring. And um, this strategy came in very late, I think a couple of months ago. It's part of the 1.0 release, and it only works with Istio uh, at this point. How traffic mirroring works is, uh, it will, so when someone calls the, uh, the main, um, the old application, the one that uh, runs production, um, we duplicate this request and we send the request also to the new version. But the response is, uh, uh, is not going to, uh, to end up on the user. So the user is not, in, not impacted in any way. And uh, the same request is sent to both versions. Now, this works only for idempotent APIs. Uh, let's say if you uh, do a bank transaction twice, <laughs> that's not going to work. But if your application is, let's say, a caching server, or you do some, it's a machine learning workload, then you can, uh, you can use traffic mirroring to uh, test the performance of the new version without affecting in any way your system. And for example, most uh, read um, requests, let's say HTTP GET, 
should be idempotent. So you could use that only for that part of the API. Uh, but for caching and machine learning, it's a, it's a really useful um, um, strategy that you can use. Um, and the last one, blue green with traffic switch. This doesn't involve any kind of service mesh or ingress control or not even layer seven routing. You can use Flagger just with the Kubernetes API and, and do blue green deployments. Um, this is not actually, it's not related in any way progressive delivery. It's an old way of doing things like duplicate everything and uh, you run integration tests, you run load tests on the, on the green version with no uh, live traffic. And if that works, then Flagger will do the switch and all your live traffic ends up on the new version. But it worked work great for legacy apps and I don't know, stateful application, application. How the deployment, the canary deployment strategy works. Well, I, I talked about it um, uh, at the beginning. You uh, progressively shift traffic towards from V1 towards V2. And if everything goes fine, then Flagger will do the switch. Uh, A-B testing, you um, segment your users based on, um, on HTTP header or cookies. So, uh, a particular user, if he's part of, let's say, of, of the uh, segment that uh, ends up on V2, will not jump from V1 to V2, will stick to V2 until the analysis is over, and uh, it will just continue with that version, all, or it will be switched back to V1 if, uh, uh, if a rollback happens. And blue-green is just running tests and then do the switch. How can you control Flagger? How you tell Flagger how to do all these uh, deployment strategies and all this stuff? So uh, how it works is uh, Flagger, when you install Flagger, it also uh, installs a custom resource definition called Canary uh, in your Kubernetes cluster. And then you can uh, define a Canary uh, resource that targets a Kubernetes deployment or a Kubernetes daemon set. So there are only these two uh, kinds that you can target with. What happens when you deploy this uh, um, carry specification? Flagger will take over your deployment and will do a lot of things. We'll create other deployments, cluster IP services and, and um, service mesh objects and all this stuff. What's important to note here is the fact that you can take over, you can, uh, uh, Flagger can take over uh, production workloads. Um, it will do it seamlessly without downtime and uh, all this stuff. So there, there is a lot of logic inside the, the code that um, is particular made for be able to take over a deployment with, with no impact to the users because, um, you don't need to redeploy everything. You can gradually switch from a classic Kubernetes deployment to a, a, one of those strategies um, inside your production cluster without you know, rebuilding your, your whole environment. And a canary specification has a lot of, a lot of things in it. Here is like, what I've put here in this slide is like the minimum, um, Canary specification that you can do. There are many, many options here. Um, so we have like a deployment target to tell Flagger, hey, um, do this deployment strategy for this, uh, for, uh, for this deployment. Uh, you also tell Flagger how to expose your application inside the cluster. Um, so you, should not, you shouldn't be uh, deploying Kubernetes services or let's say Istio virtual services or app mesh virtual services and nodes or all these objects, Flagger creates them for you. If there are on the cluster, Flagger will modify them and will own them. Um, and you, the most important part is uh, how you want to do the actual rollout. And uh, this is the analysis part when you can, where you can specify metrics, alerts, webhooks, uh, header matching, um, and many, many things. 
So let's look look at uh, what what means to do um, a canary deployment without Flagger. Um, you'll need to create um, two kinds, uh, two separate deployments, uh, two separate uh, Kubernetes services. If you have, uh, if you use H HPA's horizontal pod autoscaler, then you have to duplicate that as well. Make sure your config maps and secrets are also duplicated. So if you change, for example, let's say something in a, in a config map, it doesn't bring everything down. So you have to version those as well, uh, secrets as well, and all this stuff. So first you have to duplicate all these objects. Then you have to create for, uh, for the canary and the primary version, uh, service mesh objects or ingress objects and so on. So you can add up to thousands of lines of YAML easily. Uh, no matter what what you are using, what service mesh or ingress control. So it's a lot of uh, work and you have to be really careful how you uh, set everything up. If you use Flagger, um, what you need to do is have a deployment and a horizontal pod autoscaler, that's it, that defines your application and you create this canary object, which is like a policy that tells Flagger how to bootstrap your application inside the cluster, how to create all these uh, different versions, keep track of secrets, config maps, uh, version them, and so on. So it simplifies a lot uh, the way you define uh, your, um, your releases. In terms of traffic management, how Flagger does the traffic management, it doesn't doesn't do it on its own. Flagger is not a proxy or anything like that. It's just an operator. So it needs uh, a layer seven um, proxy or service mesh. So it works with Vistio, Linkerd, and App Mesh uh, for service meshes. And for ingress controllers, it works with Contour, Glue, and Nginx. Um, with, for Istio and Contour, everything is supported, A-B testing, uh, uh, traffic shifting, um, Istio does mirroring and so on. All the others don't support uh, some things. Uh, there is a future uh, comparison on, on Flagger uh, main readme if you are interested in seeing what was the differences between them. And it doesn't support them because Flagger doesn't implement it, doesn't support them because the underlying technology doesn't know how to do stuff. Um, how does Flagger uh, validate your, your new version? Um, so you can define KPIs, you can define thresholds, and based on that, Flagger will roll over or roll back um, the version. Uh, it also um, talks to the Kubernetes API to monitor the uh, deployment health status, so it looks at pod statuses and all this stuff. Um, it comes with built-in metrics. So if you tell Flagger, hey, use Istio, then it will know how to um, uh, calculate the request success rate and how to measure the request uh, latency average uh, value. And those two built-in metrics work with all, all these uh, service meshes and ingress controllers. Um, for example, let's say Glue. Glue doesn't come with a Prometheus server. So when you install Flagger for Glue, you also tell Flagger, hey, install a Prometheus server and Flagger will install it with the right configuration and it will uh, uh, scrape the Glue ingress controller and it will get those uh, things out. Same for Nginx and Contour. Uh, Istio, Linkerd, and AppMesh, all, all these three service meshes come with a Prometheus server. So um, Flagger doesn't need to, when you install Flagger, don't need to install also uh, from your server. Uh, so it has, it has these built-in metrics. There are only those two, uh, the success rate and the latency. Uh, and a thing that's new in, uh, in Flagger 1.0 is uh, the ability to create metrics templates uh, and define custom checks for them. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, also Flagger uh, has a thing called webhooks. So we can call some external service to start integration testing, load testing, and other, uh, any other kind of testing that you want. 
and to uh, and based on the result of those um, uh, tests, we'll take decisions. Let's talk about metric templates. So this is uh, hey, Stefan. Uh, yeah. Sorry, is it a good time to break for two questions? Sure. Oh, um, so sorry, there was an earlier one I didn't catch. Uh, so when I when I want to do progressive delivery between say country by country, would I need to first introduce the country in header or cookie? Yes. So there are things like Cloudflare that automatically injects uh, the location in your headers. So you can have like country, region, and other things. Um, if uh, if you don't use such a service, then you have to have like some kind of IP uh, database. I think there are a couple of those out there. So you will have to do this kind of app logging. You will create this cookie or create this header based on the request. On the first request, so you tag your logged in user. Oh, this is come. This one comes from this region, and then you can do the filtering. But yeah, Flagger has no idea where those requests are coming. So that's something you, know, you have to implement on your own. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the next question is, I guess, just basically, um, how does Flagger work if there's no active traffic coming into the application? How would Flagger shift from the, shift the zero traffic when it comes to deploying to a new version? I'll answer that later. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. The answer is in the slide. And, uh, okay, so Kingdon says load tester chart. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's talk about metric templates. This is a new feature in 1.0. Um, what you can do, you can define a, a, a template. Um, so it's another custom resource called metrics template. is part of uh, of the Flagger uh, resources, and with uh, with metric templates, you can define custom checks and you can target specific uh, metric providers. For example, if let's say you have a Prometheus server that you've set up where you push, let's say business metrics or uh, other things that are not in the Istio or Linkerd or AppMesh or Nginx or whatever uh, Prometheus uh, comes with those. So you can define, define a metric template. Uh, you can define the query and you can tell Flagger where that Prometheus server is, where it's running. And it also supports uh, authentication for it. You can add here a secret and you can tell Flagger what's the um, basic auth or token for, for your Prometheus instance. And then inside the query um, section, um, there are a couple of variables that Flagger will replace, like the namespace, um, the name of the target, the deployment name, the daemon set name, um, the interval that you, you are setting, the um, uh, ingress name and so on. So it's easy to create a metric template that works for not only one deployment, but for many deployments that are exposing that particular metric. Now, Prometheus is great, but you know, uh, so many companies are not using Prometheus as their primary uh, metric store. Uh, Datadog and CloudWatch are two, one of the most popular uh, metric providers out there. So um, uh, Flagger now works with, with uh, these providers and more are to come. Um, another thing is alerting. So before 1.0, for the 1.0 release, you could at install time, you could configure Flagger to send alerts to uh, Slack or Microsoft Teams. Every time a can restarts, if it fails, uh, if it needs manual improvement, and so on. So there was a system that built into Flagger that will write to a Slack channel or a Microsoft team channel. Now, the problem is that let's say you have many namespaces and you have many teams. Like you don't want all these things. Maybe you have different on-call teams and stuff like that. You don't want them all to be looking at the same Slack channel, or maybe not all teams use the same uh, alert provider. Maybe someone uses Slack, uh, others uses I don't know, Rocket Chat or Discord or whatever. So it was, it was a 
it was an issue that forces you to install multiple Flagger instances in your cluster just to be able to route these alerts to, to different providers. Um, 1.0 comes with yet another custom resource called other provider where you can define uh, uh, what are these endpoints, what channels, or what types and uh, for, for other providers types are uh, currently supported. And you can also uh, tell Flagger where is the secret that uh, contains the, um, for example, for Slack, the URL because the URL contains the token uh, and so on. Um, what this gives you is the possibility, for example, if we, if we look in the documentation, I also um, made a lot of improvements I'm saying to the docs. Um, so in the alerting here, <clears throat> so this is the old way of doing it. When you install it with Helm, for example, you will just tell Flagger, hey, here is my uh, Slack webhook. This is in here, it's not a secret, it's not you know, uh, safe at all to do that. You install it and then it will send this type of alerts to, to your Slack channel for everything that's running on your cluster. For Microsoft Teams, the, the same story. Now, the new way of doing stuff is you create these other providers and you can define how many channels or um, other thing, uh, chats solutions you are using. And then inside the analysis, you can say for this canary, if the severity is error, then ping the on-call team, which is on Slack. Um, if it's one, what that means, severity error, when, when the canary is rolled back. A warning is when it starts to fail, but doesn't fail that much that is actually rolled back or when it needs a manual confirmation. Hey, the, the canary uh, needs someone to, to click on a button and stuff like that. So you can add the Discord for your QA team and you can send all the events to your dev Microsoft team channel and so on. So that's, uh, that's what, uh, um, that's the improvement with, with other things. Also, you, when you install Flagger, you don't need to tell it about Slack or anything. You just define these other providers inside your cluster and, and Flagger will, will discover them and use them with secrets to authenticate. Um, And we got to the testing webhook. So um, Flagger comes with, there is another project inside Flagger uh, repository called uh, Load Tester. Why is called Load Tester? Because at the beginning I had this problem, hey, how can I test this? I don't have live traffic. So I've created uh, a Load Tester service that at the beginning it used, uh, oh, sorry. Um, it used Hey. Hey is a CLI that can uh, generate traffic um, for an HTTP endpoint. Um, with time, I've added um, other um, load testing tools like WRK and uh, uh, GRPC uh, load tester. And it got bigger and bigger over time. Now the the load testing service also knows how to run Helm test, bash, uh, bats tests, and you can also, when you, uh, you can build your own image and put your own uh, conformance testing tool inside. Um, there are a couple of other tools available there I can show you. Um, so here is an example when you deploy a new version before routing any kind of traffic to that version, you want to create, you want to run the Helm tests on it. So it's a, it's a webhook of type pre-rollout. This type of webhooks execute before routing any kind of traffic. If, it, if the Helm test fails, then it makes no sense to route any kind of traffic to, to your app. It fails, then you roll it back. If the Helm test is successful, then while doing the metrics analysis, it will also 
start the load test. So Flagger will call this the load tester service and it, the load tester service will execute that hey command or you can use other, other uh, load testing tools. So that's one is type rollout. The, the pre-rollout webhook is blocking. Flagger will not advance until uh, the, all these pre-rollout hooks are done. For the rollout hooks, it starts them asynchronously. So the, te the load test will run for one minute and Flagger will read metrics and validate, uh, um, uh, validate the, the metrics that you have defined. And there is also support for manual gating. Remember, everything is in this small service called load tester, but it has like different uh, things that you can do. So with uh, manual gating, you have th three types of webhooks, confirm rollout, confirm promotion, and rollback. Um, confirm rollout. When Flagger detects a new version, it will call this webhook, and this webhook must return 200 HTTP 200 to start the actual analysis. So you can, um, there is a, a gating API uh, implemented uh, inside the load tester. Um, so you can open gates, close gates, and uh, let's say you open the gate for confirm rollout, Flagger starts uh, the analysis. When the analysis finishes, let's say successfully, it will not do the actual promotion, so it will not um, roll back to 100% or um, uh, replace the, the primary deployment until the promotion gate is opened. So you can confirm rollout, then you can confirm the promotion uh, to do this as manual uh, approval of the, of the final step. And anytime during the, the analysis, you can manually roll back. Um, every time a uh, flagger uh, does a control loop for, for your canary, and you can set that um, by default is one minute, it will check this uh, rollout webhook. If the gate is open, then it means, hey, I want to roll back now. It will um, um, abort the analysis, it will scale down the canary and route all the traffic uh, to the primary. And it also has an API, you can open gates and close gates. Uh, this is the manual gating uh, features. Um, and yeah, because Flagger has this declarative model, it works really great with GitOps tools, like with GitOps operator, like Flux, uh, Jenkins X comes with Flagger uh, when you do uh, canary deployments. And I think it works with many, many other tools because it's not something that you don't have to integrate Flagger into something. You just that your, let's say, continuous deployment tool, if it applies that canary uh, release, then Flagger does its thing. So it's uh, very, very easy to integrate with um, CI and CD tools, no matter how you do it. Um, this is how it could look with, uh, with Flux. Um, you place in your Git repo the deployment, the canary object, maybe an horizontal pod autoscaler, uh, every time you change the deployment, uh, Flux uh, reconciles the state. So the new deployment is uh, applied on the cluster. Flagger detects that and does its own thing. Um, any questions, Tamo? Before I go to the roadmap? Um, so most of them were about um, asking how Flux came into play, where uh, Kingdon and I think Sebastian were doing a great job answering that. Um, and it looks like you're getting right to it. Um, and then they were asking about pod info, which they answered, which is your sample app. <laughs> Someone wasn't sure what it was. Um, and then we have one, maybe just in time, that you will answer. It's only to us, so I will paste it for everybody. Uh, and it just says, um, so Flux can keep track um, of only one Git repo to support multiple repos. Uh, is that something it will do in the future? Um, and then another question, any recommendations on deploying Flagger in AWS EKS? And then asking about um, NLB to Nginx versus NLB to Contour Ingress Controller trade-offs, Datadog versus Prometheus trade-offs, 
in EKS? Okay, so that's a lot of questions. <laughs> so maybe we'll get to that in the end if we have time. But overall, it yeah. seems like uh, the questions around uh, the relationship between flux and flagger, it looks like you were just about to get to that diagram. Uh, yeah, okay, here it is. So there is no relationship between flux and flagger. Flagger knows how to play nice with GitOps operators. This is, well, because I'm a Flux contributor and I work at, at WeWorks, when, uh, when I design Flux, I design it in a way that will not conflict with a, or with a GitOps operator that continuously apply the state. Uh, how that works? If you put your deployment YAML in, in Git, then that deployment gets created, but it's not that deployment that gets exposed to your users. Flagger creates uh, another deployment, a clone of it. It also clones uh, secrets, config maps. It discovers uh, that deployment dependencies. Even if Kubernetes doesn't have this dependency tree uh, around an application, but Flagger does it through, it looks at environment variables, volumes. Uh, so if you use uh, config maps and secrets inside your deployment, you also clone them. So it maintains this clone and this clone is called primary. So if your deployment is named podinfo, the actual thing that runs in your cluster is podinfo minus primary. And you also have, let's say, you have your a secret called database, it's a database minus primary secret and so on. So it does this clone and the original deployment, it's scaled to zero. Now, the horizontal pod autoscaler knows that if a deployment is scaled to zero, it will not watch it, it will not scale it up, right? So also Flux, if you don't specify the, the replica count inside your deployment because they are already specified in a horizontal pod autoscaler, even if it continuously apply that deployment, that deployment will not be scaled up. So Flagger uses some tricks about uh, how the uh, Kubernetes three-way merge works in order to keep that deployment scale to zero and run a parallel one. And that one is actually exposed on the cluster. Now, when you change something in a Git repo, be it in a config map or a secret or the deployment itself, Flux applies it, Flagger detects a change, sees the change and runs, scales up the deployment, then it the horizontal pod autoscaler maybe will scale it uh, higher. Flagger waits for the horizontal top, uh, HPA to do its job. And afterwards, it starts to route traffic and so on. At the end, uh, after the actual, the full rollout, uh, uh, it copies everything from the deployment in, uh, in Git to the, this primary deployment, then it scales to zero after it routed all traffic. And uh, um, this stuff, it scales to zero the, the deployment you, you actually are in control of. So this is how it works with not only Flux, but any other tool or QCatal apply from Jenkins. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, let's talk about the roadmap. How, how much time do I have? Tom? Uh, you have about five, actually, you have exactly five minutes. <laughs> okay. Technically, I guess three and a half. <laughs> okay, so um, for the roadmap, um, one thing uh, it's so with these metrics uh, templates, uh, we have now in, in Flagger an interface, and it's very easy to add more providers. So please, if you are using InfluxDB, if you are using StackDriver, or any other metric tool uh, with front. Uh, there are so many, so many others. Um, please make a pull request, contribute to Flagger and add support for your favorite uh, metrics uh, server. Um, I don't know, StackDriver and InfluxDB are things that people requested. Our issues are opened uh, on the Flagger repo. So if you are into that, if you, uh, are running these uh, these systems on your cluster? Um, please contribute uh, with the metric provider implementation. It's, it's quite easy to do if you have uh, basic GoLang uh, knowledge. Um, what 
what things uh, I hope it will uh, it will come uh, in Flagger is uh, splitting the conformance testing and the manual gating from the actual low test service. So it will be like dedicated things that you can deploy and so on. Why? Because, for example, the manual gating actually needs storage. It needs to write to let's say a Redis server or to a config map or to some database. So if you restart it, all the gates will close right now. This is what happens if you restart it because the state is in memory. So when you say, hey, I want to open the gate for the weekend, all deployments will go to production. Let's say you do that. And if someone restarts the service or let's say the node goes down by default, because it should be safe, all gates are closing when, when the, uh, when the load tester service starts. So no deployments will, will continue. Everything will wait on a manual confirmation if you are uni using, of course, manual gating. So this kind of, uh, uh, the, the manual gating should be extracted from the uh, load tester service into its own dedicated uh, small um, Golang app that saves, persists that state somewhere. Maybe in ETCD, maybe in Redis, maybe there are so many options but it needs to do this kind of persistence. Uh, another um, idea that I have is to run the conformance testing as a Kubernetes job. Why? Because maybe each test needs its own service account, its own um, um, role access, I am role, whatever. Right now you need to give all these uh, privileges to a single thing that's the tester uh, service. And um, it can be a security issue um, and it's hard to scale it up because it's just one monolithic thing that contains all the uh, CLIs there and you run it in the same pod. Um, so what, I, what I'm planning to do is make a proposal on, on, on you know, flagger issue and come up with a, a conformance testing framework that will be based on Kubernetes jobs. So you can spin up a job that takes your CLI, runs the conformance tests, and tells and flagger will know, okay, if the job failed, then I need to roll back and so on. I've experimented with this uh, a lot. The problem is with service meshes and jobs, things don't work that okay so yeah it's 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 a challenge um, but we'll get there uh, other things extend support for other service meshes that implement smi so smi is the service mesh interface uh, specification i'm a maintainer of the smi smi has recently joined cncf uh, so i'm i'm expecting for more service mesh uh, solutions to uh, implement SMI and once they do, Flagger will just work with them very, very easily because uh, SMI has a specification for traffic shifting. Um, one good example will be uh, Console Connect. Uh, I know HashiCorp is part of the SMI, so hopefully Console Connect will soon uh, implement SMI, so Flagger will just work uh, with Console Connect and Myesh and other uh, other other new service meshes. Uh, and least uh, but not last is uh, adding support for Kubernetes Ingress V2. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, uh, there is a V1 Alpha One um, CRD or that defines Ingress V2. It has so many good things. You can do traffic shifting. You can do uh, A-B testing, everything that Flagger needs. So Ingress V2, uh, it will be great. Uh, there is no Im actual implementation of the Ingress V2. So even if, let's say, you implement in Flagger, it will be very hard to test it out because no Ingress control out there knows how to deal with Ingress V2. So I'm hoping Contour or other um, Ingress makes the move, releases an alpha version uh, that works with Ingress V2 so we can, someone can get into Flagger and implement it. Uh, but I, I really like the Ingress V2 API. I think that's the future of, of Ingress. Uh, and I'm very excited that uh, 
advanced layer seven things are coming to the ingress controller without having to deal with Kubernetes annotations like it is today. Like if you look how Flagger deals with Nginx, it creates all these annotations. Um, is not something that should be, uh, I don't know, used in the future. I mean, we should have tie saved objects, well-defined objects, real validation and everything, especially about traffic routing or headers and all this stuff. So annotations are like a really hackish idea of, of getting features that only some ingress controller supports into, the, uh, into Kubernetes. V2 solves all these issues, so I'm looking forward to the to the V2 release. Um, you were asking about the case, so over um, well, time. actually, we are way over time. <laughs> so I know we said we had a hard stop. So I just wanted to let you guys know um, you're getting a sneak peek to um, how starting next week, we're going to be doing some hangout times. Uh, we're targeting Thursday or Friday. So it'll be perfect for you to come back and we can answer your questions there. Um, as you can see, Stefan likes to talk. So we're going to be doing kind of these stretch times where you'll get to hang out with the DX team and friends will come visit and we'll be covering all kinds of GitOps topics. So we're going to be doing a practice run that we'll share with the community uh, next week. So it's, it would actually be a perfect way for us to answer some of these questions. So um, check, make sure. sure you check your email. I've um, slacked here, uh, sorry, I've um, added here the links to our meetup, which will also show our calendar events, including what we plan to post for next week. Um, and you can always come ask us questions on Slack. So I know we said we'd have a hard stop and we're three minutes over. So um, please check out that and we will answer your questions there. We've obviously so much more to cover here. Bye. Um, and thanks everybody for answering the questions on there. Uh, thank you. Thanks guys. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye. See you there. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stefan. <laughs>